Hello, my name is Christina and I am a librarian with the LA County Library. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's event, A Day in the Life of the Natural History Museum, Careers in STEAM. Today's program is sponsored by Edison International and the Library Foundation. As a reminder, mics and videos will be disabled for the event. If you have any questions or comments, please place them in the chat and we will address them as time per permits. If you are having any audio or video issues, please let me know in the chat. You could also join the event via phone by calling 415-655-0001 and using the access code 133-804-1534. Finally, don't miss any of our other up, uh, great upcoming virtual events by visiting LACountyLibrary.org slash virtual dash programming and I will include all of those links and numbers in the chat. And now I will move it over to our first presenter, Leela. So we are here today um, to talk about what it's like to work in a museum. And my name is Leela Higgins and I wanted to introduce you to a number of my colleagues that I get to work with here at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So we have um, Yolanda Bustos, uh, she uses she, her pronouns, and is the manager of our museum archives and library. Did you know we had a library at the museum? Bet you didn't. Uh, we have Dr. Nathan Smith, he uses he, him pronouns, and he is our curator of the Dinosaur Institute. We have Rachel Fiddler using she, her pronouns, and she is our manager of school and teacher programs. And we have Donna Prungkir Chawat, who uses she, her pronouns, and is the supervisor for exhibit design. So you're going to get to hear from folks who work in our research and collections department, our education and exhibits department also. And again, my name's Leela Higgins, and I work in um, the community science office. So we would love in the chat for you to let us know. Um, where you're joining from today, what your name is and your pronouns, if you wanna share those with us. Do you have any access needs? Um, and what do you wanna know about museums and museum careers? Just wait a moment for, see what, uh, what you all are thinking. I live in Koreatown and if my co-panelists wanna let us know where they, live in, in LA, that would be great too. Uh, many of us are joining from home right now, as opposed to working in the museum because of COVID. I live in Los Feliz. Awesome, thanks Yolanda. Okay, we also have an icebreaker um, for those of you who are interested in letting us know if you could be an animal, any animal, would you rather fly, swim, or burrow? Don't let the flaming hot Cheeto in that grackle's mouth, you know, influence your decision. But uh, yeah, we'd love to hear. Hi, Haley. Thanks for joining us. If I had to choose, I would definitely want to swim. I would love to be able to swim into the very bottom of the deepest, darkest trenches of the ocean. Yolanda said fly for sure. Christy is also interested in flying. No one's burrowing. We got Sam from Long Beach and uh, Sam would love to fly. CP also interested in flying, Clementine interested in flying. Many of us would love to be able to go and have that bird's eye view perspective of the land and water below us. Thanks everyone. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Natural History Museum and then we're gonna head into, and Yolanda wants that Cheeto, awesome. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the museum, uh, a little bit about our, the background of the museum. And then we're going to head into um, some talks from our different staff here. So this is a picture from 1913 of the museum being built. 
So we are uh, one of the oldest cultural institutions in the LA area. I love this photograph because you can see a horse in the field in front of the museum. I love, I also love this uh, picture because I can see my office window where I'm sitting right now. Um, and this is a picture not long after opening and we opened in November on November 3rd um, in 1913. And so that means we are literally almost uh, um, we're over 100, sorry, November 6th and we're all over 100 years old. And um, this is what the museum looks like today. And on November 6th, we will be 108 years old. So we've been around for a really long time time. But we're not just a building uh, and we're not just the people that you see here today. We are a museum and that means we have a lot of exhibits and education programs too. So we have everything from the dinosaur hole exhibit where you can see Thomas the T-Rex um, on display there to Bugtopia. I studied insects so I love getting to go in our insect zoo and hang out with the insects and spiders that we have that are live and on display there. And then we have lots of programs that engage families and adults. Here you can see in the middle um, some family engaging out in our nature gardens using an insect net to look at the insects that are flying around all the flowers in the garden. And so we like to engage folks not only through these exhibits, but also through the education program. We also have research and collections happening. So that means that it's not just what's happening on the floor or at the museum in the gardens. There are lots of things happening behind the scenes. So we have many, many collections and we have over 35 million objects actually that are in the museum collections which means that we are one of the largest collections in the Western United States. Um, imagine that 35 million objects here inside the museum. And we have uh, everything from in the middle, you can see our snail scientist uh, or malacologist, Dr. Jan Van Betty, um, looking at some snail shells from our collection uh, to creatures from the La Brea Tar Pits in the collection, dinosaur bones, insects, seashells, um, so many different things, and also cultural objects, not just uh, objects that study, that uh, folks study towards science. So with that introduction, we're now gonna head into our panel um, and we're gonna start off with my friend, Yolanda. Hi, I'm Yolanda Bustos and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the museum archivist and library resources manager at the Natural History Museum. Uh, I'm gonna turn off my camera so you guys can just concentrate on the slides. And also my dog is asleep right next to me. So if you hear any snoring, please forgive us. Okay, so today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I got here and what I do. In the picture on the left here, there I am as a little girl at the La Brea Tar Pits. It was actually in a visit to the tar pits when I realized that girls and young people could be involved in science. Whoops, <laughs> back, back, back. Um, could be involved in science. And before that, I had really only seen images of scientists as older men in lab coats. So I was really excited when I got to see women in jeans digging up bones. Um, I really liked science a lot, but my real passion was art and the humanities. As a teen, I made zines and comics, and then I went to college. I majored in literature and I minored in fine arts, bookmaking and printmaking. So then two things happened in college that changed my life. The first is that I volunteered in the university library repairing books. As a bookmaker, I had the skill set to do repairs, so I tightened hinges and fixed rips, and I also got to see behind the scenes in a library for the first time. I recognized all the hard work that it took to create access and uh, connect people with services, and I was really hooked. The second thing that happened was that in my fine arts courses, I had an assignment that required me to go to an archives and work with primary source materials. Primary source materials is just another way to say that these are the first and often unique objects of their kind. So I had never been to an archives before and I didn't even really know what they were or what an archivist did. 
and my mind was just blown as I held these amazing priceless works in my hands and learned that caring for these objects was somebody's actual job. So after that, I found a graduate program at the University of British Columbia that had a dual program to earn master's degrees in both library science and archival studies at an accelerated rate. I took out way too many loans and moved to Canada for three years uh, where my work was primarily focused on the physical and digital preservation and access to materials in museum libraries and archives. And after I finished there, I took a few non-professional museum jobs before getting an entry level archivist position at the California Academy of Sciences. I grew up part-time in Oakland, so this museum and the Chabot Space and Science Center were my homes away from home, and I was really thrilled to have this opportunity. While I was there, I learned as much as I could, um, and a few years later, I, this opportunity, or I'm sorry, a few years after I started that job, I ended up running the whole archives there. And a little bit after that, this museum position opened up in LA, and I felt like it was a really good fit. So I packed up again, and I moved to LA, and I've been in this role for about four and a half years now. Next slide, please. So at the naturally, I'm sorry, at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles, I'm responsible for the research library and archives. And you're probably all really pretty familiar with library services and our research library is a lot like that, except we serve the scientists and staff of our museum almost exclusively. So our collection is really focused on providing access to information about science. The archives also provides access to materials, but our collection is made up of historic records about the museum. My job in the archives is to provide access to these records and preserve the unique materials so generations to come will, will be able to use them. While organizing the archives, you never really know what you're going to find and learn about the museum's history, and that's what makes this work really fun. So on this slide, uh, there are some things that we have in the archives. From the left to right, starting in the top row, we're looking at an exhibition planning illustration. Um, the archives also holds ephemera, which just means stuff, like the button in the middle there from the tar pits. We have proposed architectural renderings for our building. Um, scientific illustrations on that bottom row on the left, like this Smilodon fatalis, or a saber-toothed cat. And in the middle bottom there, that's the smallest book in the library, and that's the Olympic Oath, which is printed in seven languages, and it's smaller than a penny. And then on the bottom right there, we also have tons of pictures in the archives, like this one of Walt Disney with some of our curators during a visit in 1940. Next slide, please. So I've talked a little bit about why and what we do. So let me just briefly talk about how we do it. Um, all of our different types of records require specialized care, but one common practice for creating access is through digitization. So digitization just means creating digital information about a real object that can be shared the world over with anyone who has internet access. One kind of digitization we do a lot of in the archives is scanning two-dimensional objects to create a digital sur surrogate so anyone around the world can view these records and we can help reduce the amount of handling of the actual object so maybe we can make the real things last a little bit longer. We do this by making the best possible reproduction. This image is from a catalog of a 1940 expedition we did about the art of Disney. This image is scanned to a very high resolution and you can see the color target on the left there and that helps calibrate your computer so you can see the colors as they truly are. There's also a ruler to help you understand the scale of an object when you're looking at it on a monitor. The rectangle on the right there is part of the image resolution at full size. You can see the grains of paper and the way it's printed in really fine detail. And we scan at that high of a resolution. So as technology changes, we really don't have to do this work again. So digitization also helps us to protect and provide access to records that are obsolete or harder to access media like 16 millimeter film or video cassettes. Next slide, please. So I'll leave you with a sample of a recently digitized film from the La Brea Tar Pits that tells the story of how animals came to be ensnared in the asphalt. Since there's kind of a Disney theme running through here, I'll mention that the illustrator who worked on this also worked for Disney, and I think you can see it in this style. We also hold the hand-painted cells for this animation in the archives. This film was digitized through a generous grant from the California State Library's California Revealed program, and you can view it on its entirety through the California Revealed project page and on the Internet Archives. 
Leela, roll it. Basically, it shows how the animals got entrapped and you can kind of get a sense of the look and feel and how it was stop or animated using uh, cells and kind of the overall style, which is has a very Disney feel to it. And if you wanna see the film with sound, go ahead and go to the Internet Archives to the California Revealed page and I'll drop that in the chat really shortly. For now, we can just move on to Nate's presentation. Okay, I see the video. Hey everybody, I'm Nate Smith. I'm a curator here at the Dinosaur Institute, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, um, where I study the early evolution and diversification of dinosaurs uh, from their kind of humble beginnings as, you know, tiny little bit players on the ecological scene uh, to giants like T-Rex and even modern day dinosaurs like the living birds that are around us. And since we're talking a little bit about careers, I'd, I'd share a little bit about my path to the museum. Um, so I, I came here about six years ago before I was a curator at the Natural History Museum. I was a professor in the biology department at Howard University in Washington, DC, and had come there from the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, where I was a postdoc and had done my PhD work at the University of Chicago. Um, but what really got me into paleontology from the get-go, it was a bit of a different path than some of my paleontology colleagues. I have lots of uh, colleagues that um, kind of always wanted to be paleontologists, and I kind of fell into it at a later stage. Um, so this is a picture of me in 1999. I went to, uh, oh, is the screen frozen? I'm going to keep going and hopefully it'll pick up. <laughs> uh, I went to a small liberal arts college in Illinois, uh, not planning on being a paleontologist, planning on studying chemistry, but happened to take uh, a course with a paleontologist that was on faculty there. And this person, Bill Hammer, also happened to run a summer course in the White River Badlands that myself and two pals here uh, took our freshman, uh, our freshman summer. And really, that's what sold it for me. Um, being out in nature, uh, hiking around the Badlands on this ranch, collecting fossils, realizing that this could be an opportunity. Um, and I think a lot of my natural history colleagues have similar stories of you know, not necessarily taking a course or reading something in a book, but the experience itself um, that brought them into their uh, the passion for their career. And I think that's something that we try and, and do a good job of promoting and providing opportunities for here at the museum. Um, next slide, please. So uh, a kind of quick overview of, of what we're doing in the Dinosaur Institute and more generally with some of our paleontological collections. Um, some of this you're probably familiar with, but you can think of the, the start of specimen uh, work with being, coll being collection and documentation in the field, right? So going out into uh, on these expeditions, into these field sites, finding dinosaurs or other specimens, documenting them in the field, um, collecting everything and bringing it back to the lab. Uh, here in the lab, we have um, uh, numerous labs in the Natural History Museum, including some that are on public display. You can see our technicians actually preparing, you know, mechanically removing the rock matrix from bones and, and conserving those specimens so they can enter into our collections, right? Um, so that's a big part of what we do as well as catalog all this material. And as Leela pointed out, there's over 35 million specimens that we've got to take care of. Uh, once we bring it out of the ground, we've got to keep it uh, in per perpetuity. We've got to hang on to it forever, make sure that it's properly stored and taken care of and that it is accessible for researchers, for educators, um, for other people that, that want to work on these specimens. And next slide, please. And so I kind of split the second part into, okay, we've, we've got the specimens, but what do we do with them? Um, well, a big part of what we do in research and collections is actually research and publication, right? So it's a creation of new knowledge as well. So it's not just necessarily kind of housing these specimens and, and taking care of them, um, but also uh, and not just telling the stories about them, but also creating that new knowledge. And so a big part of what we do is scientific research and publication on those specimens. Um, but we also do a lot of scientific illustration, content and media creation, right? That's another way we can share the stories about these materials. And some of the funnest things that we do at a natural history museum and some of the funnest parts of my job uh, are the educational outreach activities that we do, the events that we put on um, like upcoming, uh, our dinosaur festival that will be September 26th. 
um, the exhibits that we put together. So we have our permanent exhibits, which are occasionally updated, but also we're always hosting traveling exhibits and I've got to be a part of developing a lot of those, uh, as well as um, educational films and documentaries. Um, so the, the fun part of my job at a natural history museum compared to when I used to be a, a college professor is that uh, I get to wear a lot of different hats and kind of participate in bringing our science and bringing our specimens to the public uh, in ways that I didn't get to do fully um, uh, at a university. And then one more slide. Uh, and the other thing I want to emphasize that we do is, is student training, right? So educating our, our workforce um, and, and educating future natural historians and, and engaged uh, and informed citizens is a big part of what we do. One of the things I'm really proud of here is a graduate student program that we built in the Dinosaur Institute and at the Natural History Museum where we've got a lot of talented faces and it's actually fitting that um, Nate Carroll has a big, big smile on his face because he just passed his PhD defense uh, earlier uh, last week. So he should be very happy. Um, and one of the things, since we're talking about uh, STEAM careers, that my field, the geosciences, um, as, as well as paleontology more specifically, is getting better at recognizing is that there's not necessarily kind of a strict pipeline in terms of developing STEAM and STEM talent and, and an engaged workforce. Uh, and so this is a, on, the, on the right here, an illustration from a recent paper that I like to share. And of course, it's, it's done by geoscientists, so they, they liken this analogy to a braided, a braided stream, you know, where there are many entry entryways into um, kind of a STEAM or STEM workforce. Uh, there are evolving pathways, uh, and there are there are pathways that are kind of not the traditional undergrad, graduate, postdoc into university professor style. Um, that kind of tends to get emphasized in in the pathway that we used to train students. Uh, and so it's really exciting to kind of be at a place in our careers where we're seeing this recognized and, and kind of more of a, a new models emerge of how we educate and, and train our workforce in natural history and in, in STEAM more broadly. All right, uh, thank you very much. And I think we can switch to the next presentation. Wonderful, thanks um, Dr. Smith and Yolanda. Hi, I'm Rachel Fiddler. I'm the manager of school and teacher programs, as Layla shared, um, at the Natural History Museum and over at the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum in Hancock Park. Um, I'm excited to share a little more with you all about the work that I get to do at the museum, but I wanted to start by sharing a bit more about myself and my journey into the museum education space. Um, I've always been captivated by museums. I think they are just such unique spaces for kids, adults, and everyone in between to learn and explore and wonder. And these informal learning spaces truly run the gamut of content, right? From fine art like LACMA to history and culture like the Natural History Museum to nature to Ice Age LA, um, like the Tar Pits, which was one of my faves back in the 90s, as you can see from this photo of me at the lake pit with my mom. <laughs> Which Yolanda, I loved that you had a very similar <laughs> photo with the chain link fence over at the light pit. Thought that was so cool. Um, beyond my own explorations of museums as a child and with my family, I began working summers between college at my local children's museums. Thanks, Leila. So you can see me there um, leading a group of kiddos around the Portland Children's Museum um, and probably singing a cool song about the animals that we're learning about. Um, I was attending Scripps College for degrees in sociocultural anthropology and developmental psychology or psychology that focuses on development of, of children. Um, and when it was time to start my senior thesis, which is a very long research paper that I had to write in order to graduate, I was thinking about what topics specifically in museums really interested me and that I wanted to explore more. Um, and I ended up connecting an analysis of staff and volunteers who worked specifically at Holocaust museums um, and kind of their motivations for working in that field, um, how they talked about uh, trauma and genocide with visitors, um, and just kind of how they um, themselves dealt with dealing 
um, with this intent, co intense content. Um, and so one year later, I was actually offered a position in the education department at Holocaust Museum LA, where I wrote teacher guides, led programs, and built relationships between local schools and the museum. And I was later promoted and began directing their creative programs for teens. So I led high school summer workshops in film, visual art, music, um, and writing for teens to hear from and collaborate with local Holocaust survivors, including um, Kurt Lowens, who we were celebrating his 90th birthday in this picture down on the right. We can go on to the next slide here. So um, kind of outside of my professional life or what I've done in my career, um, I'm very, very passionate about animals, nature, and education. I always wanted to be something, something with animals when I grew up or something with nature. Um, and three years ago, I saw a job posting on a nonprofit job board for the role of school and teacher programs manager at the Natural History Museum. And even before I, I applied, I was already incredibly nervous because it just sounded like such a, a dream job. And, I really was beside myself when I was eventually offered the position in July of 2019. So long story short, um, I now work at the Natural History Museum and um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I actually get to do. Um, in my job, I get to work with all of the school communities who visit our museum spaces. Um, and I'm curious who here has been on a field trip to a museum before? Does anyone have a special field trip memory that they think of? Um, I, I know I have mine, so I would love to hear in the chat where some of our friends have maybe visited before. Um, and I invite my co-panelists, if you wanna drop in your favorite field trip memory in the chat, I uh, would love to hear. We've been welcoming school visitors to our museums for generations now, as the museum has been open for over a hundred years. and. I love this um, amazing photo of a school group from the 60s that Yolanda found in the archive. Um, just a really neat reminder that these are cool spaces that um, we have to share. They are um, your, your museum, essentially. So it's such an important um, uh, department to have in order to welcome uh, school groups and, and kiddos and teachers and parent chaperones into the museum on a daily basis. Oh, fun, you've been to the ALF. I love the ALF, Haley, that's a great museum. Okay, and I have one more, one more slide. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I have the privilege of supporting all of the programming experience and engagement with school audiences. So that includes students in pre-K all the way through 12th grade, their teachers and parents like chaperones that come on field trips. Um, I also get to work with incredible colleagues, many of whom are on this program right now, um, and share the fantastic work that they do with these same audiences and kind of connect our students um, to the research that um, Dr. Smith is doing in the Dinosaur Institute or um, getting behind the scenes with Donna and exhibits about um, what is being created for our next new exhibition. So a lot of cool ways to connect all the other pieces that happen in the museum um, to our school community. Um, so my work includes the field trip programs, educational programs that we run with museum educators, teacher workshops, um, events for students, and school and community partnerships that we do um, throughout the year. And finally, I'll share that one of my favorite parts of my job is getting to wave hello to a class that has just gotten off the bus outside the museum and uh, you're walking in and you can see the dueling dinos that Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus Rex that are having quite an intense battle in our foyer behind me and everyone's eyes go wide. The students are jumping up and down, pointing and telling me about how much they love dinosaurs or butterflies or gems and minerals. And I love that part of it. I think that that excitement, that interest, that wonder um, is such a neat part of experiencing a museum. And I'll just leave with this. Um, I cannot wait to see you back at the museum soon. And I hope that the next time you step in the doors, you will embrace that sense of wonder and discovery that is such a neat part of um, being in museums. And with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Donna. Hi, everyone. My name is Donna Pongpri Chawat, and I am the super supervisor of exhibition design here at the museum. And that basically means I get to 
come up with and design everything that's associated with an exhibition. So whether it's graphics or furniture or displays, I get to do that for my job. Um, and my path to becoming an exhibition designer here at the museum was a really long and windy one. Um, I would have to say that uh, it started with a childhood love of building things. Um, in, and in particular, I loved playing with Legos. I loved building houses with Legos. Um, you can see on my slide here, that's not a house that I myself built, but it looks similar to something I would have built. Um, so I was always building things and creating things. Um, and that eventually led me to take some architectural courses at my local community college. While I was there, I learned um, all things associated with three dimensional design. Um, and I also honed my skills at building architectural models. And I really loved that because I loved building miniatures. And it was just so cool to be able to make something out of nothing, out of just some drawings and some dimensions. So I eventually got an internship at a couple of architectural firms to make these models for their clients. Um, all of that experience led me to actually attend uh, Art Center College of Design, where I studied environmental design. And, and I eventually graduated with that degree. And that degree is basically a general ed of 3D design. So anything in our environment that we interact with whether it's uh, architecture, uh, furniture, even exhibits or landscape design, I studied there. So I was really interested in this broad range of design. Um, after graduating school, I wasn't really sure what to do. Architecture seemed like the closest thing that I knew that could satisfy my interests. So I uh, worked in architecture for a few years and I, really loved it. I loved designing homes for people and really thinking of how people will live in these spaces. Um, but, you know, if when I was honest with myself, there was something that was still not. Not exactly the right fit for me. Uh, architecture was a little too uh, perfect and a little too permanent. Um, so then I jumped ship and went and practiced in the landscape architecture field for another few years. And it was really amazing having all these beautiful trees and plants to work with and being able to be outdoors and designing these outdoor spaces and seeing them change over the course of the season. But again, when I was honest with myself, there was something I was missing about landscape design and I felt like I wasn't able to build as much as I would have liked to. Um, so after that, I was really just exploring. I um, tried out product design. I um, tried out designing graphics. Uh, I even tried out fine art. Um, I also collaborated with a friend of mine to design costumes for his live performances. And I really felt like I was just searching for the right place. And I really couldn't find what that right place was where all of my interests and skills really came into play at a day job. Um, and that is until I found exhibition design. And for the first time when I worked in exhibition design, I found that all of my skills came into play. All these things that I thought were just weird interests of mine that didn't really fit into my day job all came together. I got to design space. I got to design furniture. I got to design graphics and really think about the experience of exhibitions. Um, I first started working at the Getty Museum and then um, hopped over to the Natural History Museum and I've been here close to six years now. So next slide, please. So on a regular day, I would divide my day up between working on the computer and working in person and collaborating with my colleagues. So on the computer, I use um, 3D modeling programs. This one is SketchUp. Um, it's free if any of you are interested, anybody, any of you out there are interested in playing around with it, but I use that 3D modeling program to really build out the exhibition in this 3D space. I also use that program to figure out how to design and build um, display furniture, as you can see on the, the bottom left. 
Um, I use another program that um, is a drafting program. So that lets me draw really precise line drawings of what these uh, furniture pieces and what the gallery will look like. These drafted drawings have notes and dimensions and they're given to fabricators and our installers so that they know how to actually build this, this exhibit. Um, on, the, on the computer, I also use graphic design software and I um, create graphics for the show. So when I'm creating graphics, I work really closely with the developer or the writer of the show to make sure that their stories that they've written are communicated effectively while also being visually interesting um, and pretty. <laughs> um, um, the other half of my day, I would say, is um, working in person with my colleagues. So we will you know, um, build something physical that we want to test, that we want to eventually put into the gallery. Um, we will um, collaborate and talk and look at actual pieces of furniture and really determine what the best way is to build something or the best way is to install something. And if I'm really lucky on a good day, I will get to work alongside um, some of our museum's amazing collections. So if you look at the image on the upper right, those are some of our preserved insects in our collections. And I was able to use those insects as some of my material um, that I got to design with for this, uh, this exhibition. Um, so next slide. And of course, the very best day is the day when an exhibition opens. And all of our hard work, all of the team's hard work ha, um, finally gets to um, be seen by the public and gets to be physical in a, in a physical space. So seeing our visitors play with these, um, with the furniture I've designed or interact with some of the interactives is just so rewarding. And to um, know that, you know, the public now gets to learn and enjoy a space that you know, first existed only in my mind and now has become a physical space um, is just truly rewarding. So that would be the, the best day that I could possibly have at the museum. And that's it for me. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm trying to um, get my video back on. Okay, I think it's on now. Um, so if we could have all the panelists put their videos on. We're going to head into some Q and A. So, um, at, please, we want to hear any questions you have about museums, about working in museums, specific questions for any of us. Um, but while you're thinking about those questions, I'm going to kick us off with. We loved hearing from folks about how you went on field trips to museums when you were a kid. I'd love to hear from all of our panelists. What's a memory you have from a museum field trip when you were a kid? And we'll just make sure we all get a chance to answer. Rachel, you look really excited, so maybe you should <laughs> kick us off. I just love that you asked this question, Leila, because I think it, it just uh, really sparked something in me that we have these um, kind of transformative moments in, in museum spaces. And um, there, there's that, that field trip that you really remember or just a space outside of the classroom that really spoke to you it doesn't even have to be a museum. Um, and I mean, I, I probably went on a lot of field trips that I could speak to, but um, one of my favorite places and actually Clementine mentioned it in the chat was um, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. We lived on the East Coast for a little while. And I remember I was just, I couldn't even get inside the museum. I was just in that first section with that like huge sauropod that is in that kind of like reared up position. If anyone's been in there before, they'll know what I'm talking about. And just standing underneath it, I was I felt so small, but like so, I don't know. It just felt um, the, the immensity of the animal and also just what it was to me felt um, so so cool and magical. And that really always stands out to me. So I'll pass it on to someone else if they want to share too. I can I can share two memories very okay. specifically very specifically of our museums. I remember coming to the Natural History Museum and the Orfish, seeing the Orfish, which is still there, and I remember going to the tar pits and um, interacting with the tarpole, which is still there. 
So those are my two <laughs> very memorable memories of our two museums. And now I get to work there. I'll jump in. I, I grew up. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I'll be quick. I grew up outside of Chicago, so I can I could punt and say go into the, the field museum all the time as a kid because there was a million things there that I loved. But an early memory was going to the Museum of Science and Industry, which had this kind of now in hindsight, very fake plastic looking replica of a giant blue whale heart. And me and my brother just climbing all over it like a jungle gym inside and out. And and that's sticking with me for a long time, just being really impressed by that. <laughs> I don't know how my internet is if I cut out. Um, uh, yeah, in briefly in my talk, I went to the California Academy of Sciences on field trips, and I really loved it there. Um, and one thing that I particularly loved and still loved Steinhardt Aquarium. That's part of it, um, and, and it's beautiful. If you need to go, um, and I remember looking at all the fishes did, and it was it was a little bit different than than it is now. Now it's really something to behold. But um, it, it always just really moved me. And even when I worked there recently, when I needed like a break from mold, I would go down and, and look at the fish. And that's something that really stuck with me over time. Thanks. I remember as a kid, my dad took me to London with my little sister and we went to the Natural History Museum. And when you walk into that space, there was a giant long neck dinosaur. They called it Dippy because they used to call it a Diplodocus or Diplodocus, as you say in England. Um, and then I was kind of like, cool, that's awesome. But at the top of the stairs, there was a giant redwood, uh, like a piece of a redwood tree. And I, my tiny self sat and looked up at this giant tree and was amazed that that tree could exist on this planet. And then now I live in California and I've got to visit those trees in person and stand underneath the giant redwoods and the giant sequoias and look up at them and be awed and wowed by them. So thanks everyone for sharing. We have a question from Sam specifically for Donna. How long does it take to go from concept to the start of an exhibit? Oh, it can vary. I, I think Nate has been involved in from um, in some exhibitions from the very germ of an idea um, to and then seeing it, you know, get onto the floor. But, it, you know, it can be years to from the start of an idea, gathering ideas, gathering information, even getting funding. Um, uh, I would say for for the time that I'm involved in an exhibition, it might be anywhere from you know, two years to eight months, even quicker if it's a small exhibition, I would say average might be a year for a medium sized exhibition. But, you know, different people jump in at different times. So, you know, the researchers and writers jump in a lot earlier. They're getting that idea together of what it could be. And then once, once that gets a little more baked, the designer jumps in and starts to help visualize everything um, and again, depending on how big or ambitious it is or how small it is, it could be anywhere between two years to just, I think we just installed the oar fish, no, not the oar fish, the um, angler fish in, you know, a month and a half. <laughs> so anywhere be in between. Thank you so much, Donna. While we're waiting for more questions, um, I'm, Curious to know what advice you all might have that you wish you had been given your younger self. Um, so if there's any advice that you could give your younger self about getting a job at a museum, what would it be? I would just in general, even if it's not in a museum, I would just say volunteer at wherever you're interested in working. You know, just get some experience, make some contacts, put yourself out there. You know, that's the best way to get into it is just to do it and just try it out. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that because I think it kind of holds true in an academic career as well, is that trying it out, whether it's as a volunteer or through a, a workshop or a program is the best way, like, you know, to get your feet wet and really figure out if you like doing this or not, as opposed to kind of just necessarily reading about it or kind of having a more passive experience with with the position. 
I would also jump in and piggyback on that. I also think um, in addition to kind of just experiencing like the museum space, um, I, I really found that my work in college, um, so my, my classes, even though none of them were specifically about museum work, um, kind of led me down finding what I was more interested in and trying classes that I maybe wouldn't have expected to try out. Um, just, just opened my eyes to other fields that I hadn't even considered before. Um, and then making connections with people in those fields that could then even just I could ask questions to them and, you know, they didn't necessarily have a job for me, but they could just share what they do and I could learn from them and then have a contact later that may say, oh, I know Rachel and, you know, you should meet her. Like she might be interesting for this job or it just helped to piece together some things. So I would recommend kind of that piece as well. Thanks everyone. We have a question from earlier from uh, Ariane, I uh, hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, and you, Ariana, Ariana sorry, uh, used to go to the Science Center School and visited the Science Center and our museum. And uh, her question is, I would love to know the best way to work in a museum now, currently as a college student. So I think there's gonna be a little bit of a different answer than we just gave about volunteering. I can kick us off with, uh, it depend, depends on what, what college you go to, but we have work study relationships with um, USC. And then I think we're looking at work study relationships with other colleges too. So if you get work study as part of your financial aid, um, which is something that I got when I was in college, and that was how I got my first job uh, working in the science field. So I've worked for the um, uh, a forest fire lab. So I got to go and like hang out with scientists that were starting fires in the in the forest very safely and what they call control burns. Um, and so we have a number of work study students that have worked in our office and some of my colleagues work with work studies regularly. And so not only do you get paid, but you're also getting to do that while you're in college. But uh, what about um, other forms of how we can work with college students? Um, I know that um, the exhibits department has had interns. So these are, I know the, the interns that we've had have been funded, have been paid for through um, the Getty Marrow um, internship. Um, so that is, I think, a yearly, annually uh, internship cycle. Um, so if you're a college student, maybe you might uh, you know, check that out, Google that, and they have applications and that can connect you to different internships um, for different museums and get paid. One thing I'll, I'll say really quick, because yeah, as someone that went to a small liberal arts college, you, you're kind of sometimes limited by what's going on at your own institution. And if you are a college student that's interested in gaining, say, research experiences, the National Science Foundation has a great program called REU or research experiences for undergraduates. And museums have been involved in it. The Field Museum runs the program. Smithsonian has off and on. We're trying to get one going. Jan's working on it. Um, but I just had to look it up. So I'm gonna throw that link in the chat if that's helpful to, to look through to see where different projects are set up. Thanks, Nate. I was going to start looking for the link, but you were already way ahead. So that's great. We've got a question from Monica. How do you decide what to show in the museum? Donna, you might want to kick us off since you work in exhibits. I think right, recently we've established a more um, a, a, a more thorough process. Um, there is an application that people can fill out and submit to our exhibitions. Um, I guess our director and I think there also is one, uh, like a, what do we call it? Like a, a open house. Uh, I think once a year where everybody in the museum, all of our staff were invited to come and jot down their ideas for an exhibition on the board. And we all collect that. And there's a rubric that our, um, our department has set up that's based on um, kind of the goals of the museum um, whether it serves LA, if it's of, for, and with LA, if it's um, supporting some 
you know, some other initiative that we want to, um, we want to, you know, bring up. So, based off all of the ideas that we get, uh, we, we get that we collect from the museum and we, um, you know, run that through that rubric and then I guess all the ones that meet the, the goals that we have kind of rise to the surface and then we have to figure out, you know, funding, scheduling and all that. So, it usually takes a while for an exhibit to go from like a kernel of an idea to actually getting on the floor, but there is a system. <laughs> And it's, it's about, you know, what's most interesting to people, what relates to LA and what meets our goals as an institution. We have another question. This 1 came in from Adan Lopez. Um, what opportunities are there for young kids who are very interested in museum opportunities around the young teen. Age. I'm happy to share a few things that I know from my colleagues in education and then. Leila, I might pass it to you because I think there's probably some fun things in your department that you can share about. Um, there are programs for teens um, through our public programs department that are currently on hold because of, of COVID-19. Um, but that is something that folks can sign up for and participate in. Um, we also have like a teen internship program, which is specifically right now um, at, I believe, Roosevelt High School through the Mobile Museums program. Um, so that's at a specific school right now, but that's something that we do hope to expand eventually. Um, you also can volunteer as young as 16 years old at the museums. And uh, Yolanda dropped in the chat. There was a question about volunteering right now from Jose, and currently that is on hiatus. Um, though we hope to bring back volunteers in 2022. So I would encourage you if you are 16 or older, um, there's so many cool volunteer opportunities at the museum, and that's a really neat way to um, get to be kind of in and behind the scenes and on the floor at the museum in a really neat way. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. I'm putting a link into a program that we did. Um, again, our colleagues in education worked on a program that was co-created with teens themselves. So it's not just us adult museum staff saying, this is what teens are really going to like at a museum, but no, we worked with um, teens and they told us what they wanted to do. And that was over at the Tar Pits. And so that link I just put in is a video about that. Um, and yeah, we have a lot of uh, community. So I run the community science program with um, some of my colleagues here. And that's a great way to get involved. You can, again, we are on hiatus for in person programs um, right now just because of COVID safety. But we're really hoping soon to be able to get uh, programs online. And so we take people out into the community, out into nature, and we look for nature together. And then we use our smartphones um, to take pictures. And then sometimes we like add on little magnifier clips like this if we've got really something tiny. So we can put that on our phone and we can like get a picture of an ant. And then maybe we'll be able to identify that ant from that photograph that you took. And maybe it's an interesting ant that our scientists want to know about. I did hear literally right before this that um, two of our researchers who um, are friends with us who work at another uh, university started an, a project about harvester ants. And they're wanting people to send in pictures of harvester ants to a free app called iNaturalist. And so I'll put a link into iNaturalist um, for you. And we got another question um, got sent in to Jose. Are there dinosaur bones on display? Are they real? If not, where are the real ones? I guess this one is for me. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yes, there are dinosaur bones on display. We do have real dinosaur bones on display, but we often have a, a mix of some cast or replica specimens some skeletons that are partial real material and partial bones because it's very rare to have 100% complete of a specimen. But again, kind of kicking back to what Leela talked about earlier, we've got about 35 million specimens. And so what that means is that the vast majority of our physical specimens are off display, you know, behind the scenes being conserved and cataloged and curated and taken care of. 
But um, one of the advantages of having redone a lot of our paleo exhibits, you know, in the past 10 or 15 years here at the Natural History Museum is that we have a lot more real material on display, which has been a really big trend in the past couple of decades in natural history museums to showcase that real material. And it takes a lot of extra work to do that. <laughs> it's, it's much more expensive. It's logistically trickier, but it can be really beautiful too, uh, given kind of a nod to what Donna talked about. One of my favorite things to do is you look a little bit like a pervert, but go stand behind the dinosaur specimens or our real specimens and see the intricate med metal work that goes into mounting and taking care of those actual specimens because it's really beautiful in art in and of itself. Thank you so much. Um, and for maybe wrap up question, what has been your most exciting day or part of a day at the museum, at the Natural History Museum in your whole time here? I know the first thing that comes to my mind, it was not long after I started working here and someone said, they've got a great white shark up on the loading dock and so I got to go see a great white shark that had washed up on the beach and was being prepared to be put in our collection. And I'd never seen a great white shark up close. So that was really cool. And it was really amazing to get to see some of our scientists preparing that specimen, like Nate said, to, to live in the museum collection in perpetuity for scientists to study decades into the future, maybe one of you will become a scientist and will study that great white shark, you know, in a few years from now. I can go next. Um, I had to think because there's so many amazing days, <laughs> but I think the most amazing for me was when I got to see Tim Bovard, our museum taxidermist, um, preparing the lionesses to go into our lion, um, diorama. So these lion skins had been in the freezer for decades, I believe, and he was preparing them to to update the what was in the, the dioramas. So I, I went to his work area. He had the foam structure underneath and I actually got to see the skins of these lions and he had fitted the head on one of them and the teeth were out. And it's like, how do you ever in life get that close to a lion's mouth <laughs> um so to see that and to see his his um commitment to scientific accuracy his artistic ability um was just amazing and i don't think i will ever be able to see that again in my whole life so that was really amazing you stole mine donna i was gonna say that <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I also, as you mentioned, yeah, there's so many great days. Um, I think one of my favorite memories of working at the museum um, was probably my opportunity to go on one of the um, paleontological digs that they did in August of, I guess that was 2019. Um, and I got to go out on a little tiny plane out to um, somewhere in Utah and um, have a have a very deep appreciation for all of the work that um, our friends in the Dinosaur Institute and the amazing like graduate students and volunteers that were present as well, working so, so hard in the hot, dusty heat um, and being a part of that and, and seeing um, the fossils that had been excavated from that site um, now being worked on in the Dino Lab on the second floor at the museum. So that was a real full circle thing. and. Um, like you said, Donna, I don't know if I'll ever have that opportunity again. It was truly a once in a lifetime experience. Yeah, one of mine was probably um, getting to see the culmination of all this hard work that Donna talked about when we debuted the Antarctic Dinosaurs exhibit in LA. We got to coincide it with a fundraiser we do called the Dino Ball every couple of years. And so for me, that was fantastic. You know, you get to get dressed up, you're there with all your colleagues, you get to see this exhibit, you worked, you know, your whole life on collecting and working on the research, but also several years doing the exhibit on, and you get to have a big party. So that was a pretty fun day. <laughs> and Nate was a cartoon in that exhibition. So he got to see himself illustrated, which is, I think would be pretty awesome. 
Uh, and last week, I'm going to share for Yolanda, who said their internet's pretty spotty. Um, but Yolanda said it's a tie between when she got to meet Odin, who's our one eyed screech owl, um, when he first came to the museum, um, or when one of the mammal curators let her gently pet some of the study skins from uh, our study skin collection. Um, and she wouldn't be able to pet those animals in real life. So I'm wondering if it was like a tiger or a lion or something. Uh, so thanks so much for that, uh, Yolanda. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Your questions were amazing. Uh, we love to hear from you if you want have any more questions about um, uh, working in the museum. And you can email us at nature at nhm.org and we will forward those questions to folks um, and yeah, help help you get the answers that you need. We want you to work in museums and we um, really appreciate you all coming today. So thanks so much. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing your resources and that just wonderful information for us. We really enjoyed this program. Thank you so much again for everyone who um, attended. And um, with Discover and Go, you can actually get free tickets to the Natural History Museum and the Liberia Tar Pits by going to lacountylibrary.org slash discover. So um, be sure to check that out. Um, also, uh, be sure to follow us on all the socials at LA County Library. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Thank you all again.